Okay, Transit Geeks, it's now time for the General Manager's Report, otherwise known as Neil's Bullshit. And um, Let me, before we start this, let me say, I know that I'm very disrespectful, and, and part of me is sorry about that. I, I know it's not nice to do what I do to Neil and some of the other staff, and, but it's all in fun, it's all in fun. I'm sure that you guys over there... No, this is all in fun, and, uh, you know, and, and also, you know, you're not all that respectful to your employees, so, you know, it's not that, it, there's some justice involved, but, you know, I, I apologize for the, the lack of respect I have, but anyway, that being said, it's time for Neil's Bullshit. Roger. Mr. Board President, members of the board, let me just start by uh, also um, offering a thanks to Ride Connection for this use of this great facility and more importantly their continued partnership in so many areas of our work. Um, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Board President, the, uh, the work that has been going on related to Low Income Fair Task Force. Again, Elaine Wells has been a, a key participant in that. And again, there are a key uh, help uh, with us in terms of managing the access transit uh, discount prog discounted fare program, particularly working with their network of nonprofits. And so, again, it uh, you know what he's talking about, I hope. What he's talking about there is a, is the so called TriMet low income fare program, you know, that, that you can't get any information about at all. It's not posted on the TriMet website, it's not, not posted anywhere. You have to be like part of one of these agencies that are out in Portland in order to get that low income fare. It's it's completely uh it's a complete mystery. This is that's why people like Opal are fighting for a low income fare that anybody can can get, you know, if you're if you're poor and you need to have a break on your bus fare, you, you can get this low income fare and it's available to everybody. The way TriMet has it now is how TriMet does business. You have to be hooked into some other agency and TriMet gives these other agencies the money and TriMet takes off their 10% and the agency takes off their 10%. And that's pretty much how TriMet works with everything. They, they, don't, they don't give anything to the people directly. Everybody has to get their cut first. And the, and the low-income fare program in Portland is, is pretty much a disgrace because you're not hooked into one of those programs, tough shit, $175 fare. I mean, fine, if you don't have your fare. Replaceable work that they do for us that we're very grateful. Um, I wanted to just address a few of the issues that came up in the public forum. Um, first of all, uh, Mr. Walker noted uh, issues with snow and ice and the uh, blockages of bus stops that occurred throughout the region. There's no question that was a big problem. Um, uh, I would just note related to TriMet facilities, it was even a big problem on our light rail platforms and some of our own facilities, sort of trying to keep up with it. Um, Stop them right there because this, this is not new, okay? I was there in 2008 when they had the same problem, and they did the same lessons learned, which is what he's going to talk about. So, I mean, this is a complete fail because they don't have enough staff. There's not enough people to shovel. There's not enough pe They don't have enough bus drivers. They don't have enough buses. They don't have enough mechanics. They don't have enough service workers. Of course, he's not going to say the truth. He's going to make excuses. The truth is... They don't put enough money into direct services and service support. And nobody says a thing because, I don't know, bad transit service is normalized in the United States. One of the things that we'll be talking about associated with the budget is beginning to augment, for example, some of our contracted um, uh, snow removal services so that we actually have uh, more fuel in the tank, if you will, related to our ability to, uh, to really respond to these circumstances. What he just said there was they intend to outsource. They're going to outsource contracts to deal with it. They won't bring it in-house. They won't have enough staff. They don't want to add any more staff. It's an anti-union thing. I mean, as I said in the last thing I just said is they need more people hired at TriMet to fulfill these services. But he's not going to do that. He's going to do the anti-union thing and outsource it. And that's, that's how he thinks. He's a Republican, actually. You know, he's, he says he's a Democrat, but he's actually a Republican. We already know about the Democrats. They're fakes. You know, they're not for the people. They're, the Democrats are just Republicans pretending to care. Because, again, they just outstrip our ability to have staff actually respond, and we really need a lot of help. 
I would just note uh, there was an interesting uh, interview of our new Portland mayor, Ted Wheeler, in the Daily Journal of Commerce yesterday, and he said, what did you learn from uh, that uh, event, Snow and Ice event? And it was an interesting observation, but it was how few Portlanders actually owned a shovel. Uh, That's completely bullshit, okay? If any of you, if any Portlander had lived in Portland from 2008 or before, they had a shovel, okay? Because 2008, there was two weeks of this. And everybody had a shovel after that. Now, everybody that might have moved here since, who knows? But anybody that has been in Portland for any amount of time has a shovel. So that's another phony excuse, little joke. Uh -huh. See, we didn't have a shovel either. Because people in Portland don't have a shovel, and that means TriMet doesn't have a shovel. Uh, <laughs> because, again, uh, one of the key uh, uh, sort of... Uh, Sometimes people don't recognize that they're asked to maintain the sidewalks in front of their property themselves. And uh, if you don't own a shovel, it's pretty hard to do that. So, uh, again, I think one of the things we will do is we take a very uh, active part of developing lessons learned out of all of these events. There you go, folks. The lessons learned. That's the bureaucrat, technocrat answer to everything that goes wrong. Anytime something goes wrong, they use lessons learned as their excuse. Oh, well, we've learned our lesson. The problem is they don't learn their lesson. Anybody that's been following this material for any amount of time knows that nothing's going to change. The same thing's going to happen. It's bullshit. Uh, we now have a better inventory of some of the really key sensitive areas. We'll work with our jurisdictional partners to make sure they know about that and issues. <laughs> <laughs> sitting there, sitting there, lying through teeth. I would say, in general, our coordination with uh, with ODOT, with the City of Portland, and the other road agencies is excellent. Um, I can recall a few years ago where um, the city was plowing roads and they pushed the snow right into the light rail alignment, and so those sorts of things don't happen. We we've, we've actually been making progress on all of those those fronts. Um, but we have more to do. We have more lessons to learn. And obviously the events that we had over the last couple of months were really extreme uh, for us uh, as a region. And so we were all really tasked. But just to note, we are focused as a staff on trying to sort of figure out how to do this better and to coordinate our snow and ice um, services with, uh, with both private property owners as well as um, uh, road agencies. Uh, that will continue to be a work in progress, I suspect, uh, as we uh, advance. Um, Mr. Uh, Joseph Lyons noted uh, some of the uh, work that we've been doing associated with the Division Transit Project and the, perhaps the development of stronger grid of north-south and east-west service within East Portland. And uh, you'll certainly be briefed on our proposed service for this year, but one thing that we're really pleased to be able to uh, include in that plan is a north-south bus route on 162nd, as well as some improvements to the routes on uh, 181st. So I think even in advance of that division transit project and the expected reallocation of bus hours for line four. Uh, this is the so-called uh, POW division boondoggle. I mean, this is really one of the stupidest things I've heard since I've been tracking this stuff. I, doesn't make, Look, if you know about the agency, you know that this is just a capital project to feed the capital projects. It's completely unnecessary. It's going to create a huge headache for the people that live and use it up there, and the service isn't going to be any better. So I, I don't know if people track to this bullshit, but it's bullshit. It's complete bullshit. It's just feeding the capital projects monster. The capital projects monster owns TriMet and Neil. Neil was capital projects. And it's all about capital projects there. And and this, the division thing is completely a wasteful project. It's worse than West. And West, you know, look what happened with West. It was a complete failure. But, you know, it's there. They're going to keep it going. It's going to suck money down. And that's, you know, these technocrats, they don't care what happens. Neil will walk away, big fat pension. It doesn't matter what happens later. They're like the bankers that crash the economy. They, they steal everything they can for themselves and walk away while everybody else is stuck with the bill. That's what's going on here, by the way. Uh, to other service within the neighborhood, which is our commitment associated with that project, uh, we are trying to make some really good progress. I would also note that um, with your support, we've 
uh, advance some improvements to line 20, uh, which is um, Burnside for the most part, um, and uh, that and those service improvements are actually going to be in place in June of this year. So, uh, some very and a very important line for us really should be upgraded to full frequent service, and we're getting pretty close with this next layer of improvements on it. Yes, the line 20 should be full frequent service, and we're talking about eight minute service, not 15 minute. 15 minute service is not frequent service because if one bus falls out you can theoretically be up to a half hour away. Eight minute service or less is frequent service. And not only should it be actual frequent service, it should be 24 hours. They need 24 hour service in this city. If you want people to be serious about transit, you have to have 24 hour service. Transit's a joke if you're going to be stranded somewhere without service. And in Portland area, it's like 10 o'clock, I think, is when the service pretty much goes away. That, that's, that's a joke. I remember I used to live by on the 15 line, and I, I would take the train from the airport to go home, and I would have to get off at the stadium, and it would be a half hour wait for the 15 bus, you know, and that's at that's at nine o'clock at night. That's not good service, okay? That's crappy service. Um, I just wanted to note Mr. Forrester's comments about max rule violations. Um, I would say that we have actually added a couple additional trainers. We are proposing more, uh, and the budget will have some response to that as well, uh, and we'll highlight that for you. Um, and I would also just note that I think we've, we are, in terms of the, sort of the discipline issue, I, I would say that really our focus is on training and making sure people understand uh, sort of the heightened expectations associated with this, and I think we all agree that that's desirable and important. Right. Anthony Forrester did a, a speech. I was waiting for the union to put up theirs. If they don't do it in the next day or two, I'll put it up. But uh, he did a, a speech about this, and, uh, you know, and Neil just said uh, it's important that people understand the expectations. Well, my understand, I listen to the dispatch. I listen to the controllers. They don't have any break time, okay? They have those people stuck on those trains for hours at a time, all right? Hours at a time, they're stuck there. And have you ever, have you ever watched those guys? They're like, you know, they're, they're so focused on the road. And imagine not getting a break. You're just, you're just sitting there focused to, uh, all the time on your job. You have nobody to talk to, really, except for the controllers. I mean... He wants to have heightened expectations, but they don't want to improve working conditions. And I, I think Anthony talked about that. Um, and, and I would say that we're not being um, heavy-handed in that uh, as we approach this and recognize that it's really getting everyone to be successful. That's the real job of management here. So just, just to note, and Doug will be giving a, a presentation on rule violations if you have further uh, uh, comments on that. But we are really working very, very hard on those, those efforts. Um, related to the new MAC station, we will take a look at that. We've done some work on that before, but I just also wanted to note to the board that uh, the, the Portland Streetcar Board is beginning to look at other ways uh, and routes to extend the streetcar. One route that has gained some... So now they want to add more streetcar. They want, they want to redo division. They want to add more streetcar. They want to add a light rail line to target. They want to do all this stuff. It's it's fucking crazy, okay? It's fucking crazy. And I can't believe people are getting roped into this. I mean, they're going to use the same formula that they use in Los Angeles and Seattle to try to get the money out of the city. And we know the citizens are stupid, and it's very easy to fool the public and just look at our elections. It's, they're very... <laughs> the public does not see behind the veils of lies that the government perpetuates. So so they want to add more streetcars to why? Because they want to feed the the light rail mafia. That's why. I know it's you don't want to say that. It's the truth. It's it's absurd. Favor for all the reasons that were noted by the neighborhood uh, association uh is the Broadway corridor uh between Hollywood and um the central east side. Uh, it, it seems to make a lot of sense, both from development and uh, and for other reasons. So there is some forward momentum in that area. Um, but I, obviously, as as everyone on the board understands, a stop also makes everyone else uh, trip uh, a, a minute or two longer. So there's real implications for all that service that's on the band field of a new stop, and that 
direction to remind you that it's the blue line, it's the green line, um, and it's the red line that are, would be affected. So to some extent, um, you know, one of the things that we probably should be thinking about in terms of a really long-term strategy is how do you have a, a local line and a more of an express line in that neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. um, space constraints, very tight in there because of the railroad and the freeway on either side of that, but nonetheless, um, those are, um, uh, it, it is an important and very rapidly growing area that we know are, is going to uh, need more service uh, one way or the other. Excuse me, Neil? Yes. A question on um, installing a stop on an existing line, and you may not have the answer right now, but is how much does something like that cost? It order, order of magnitude, because as the gentleman was speaking, obviously it sounds like there's justification for putting something there, but I, I think we'd probably end up having to change track alignment, obviously because along that alignment the stations are in, the, in between the tracks, right. and then to get people down there, so it's it's not an easy job. No, uh, I, and I uh, appreciate the question, <coughs> Director Prosser. The, um, the challenge in the Sullivan's Gulch area, so to speak, is particularly um, challenging uh, because it requires a grade separation over the Union Pacific tracks and over the freeway to provide access to the station. So that's not an easy thing to do. Um, and then in addition to that, there's the sort of limited space between the railroad right of way and the freeway right of way. So it doesn't appear to me there's, you know, an immediate easy solution. We've added stations in the past, one recent in, um, in Gresham at the Civic Neighborhood and um, you know, Director Stovall's home station, I would say. <laughs> um, yeah. And so that's possible, but that was in Please relatively flat that. ground with, <laughs> with space available where we could simply put the platforms <laughs> on the other side. And that's an investment of about, a, about two plus million dollars to do that. Um, so, but this this would be a very unique engineering challenge, no question. Okay. Um, I just also just wanted to make a note on, on the ridership, and I think the board reported uh, quite accurately. We, this is an issue of, of great focus on our part, and our marketing and planning staff are doing a number of studies about where is ridership declining, and how is the, and what are the issues that people. Obviously, he can't let that one go. He, I'm sure he's realized by now that Jim Howell busted him in his head on that. So now he's trying to backpedal and maybe be a little bit more clear, uh, at least offer an answer that's reasonable. But, you know, Jim Howell go, gave you the answer, okay? Of course, what we say out in the audience doesn't mean anything to the technocrats that run everything. You know, they, they listen because it's the law, but they don't really listen you know I don't really care what we think so here here he is backpedaling a little bit on his bogus answer from before people see but I'd also just note um, and I will uh, touch on this with the operations report the other really uh, I think driving concern for us is to make sure the service that we do offer is as good as it can possibly be and that's where we get to things like on-time performance and and uh, adherence to schedules and that sort of thing and I would say Obviously, he has no real idea about operations, uh, you know, and what's really going on out there. He's, you know, I'm sure he spends his days dealing with capital projects and not uh, operations. Uh, something else needs to be said about the ridership and why it's flat. The system re already is at maximum capacity. And, and uh, like Jim Howell said, that's the reason the ridership is declining, because they're, they're already at maximum capacity. They can't carry anymore. They have everything full. Go to a rush hour and watch and see what's going on. People can't get on trains. They can't get on buses. They have a serious underinvestment in service. Okay, that's the problem here. It's like Jim Howell said. They, they, they have cut too many bus lines. And they don't run enough trains. They're seriously underinvested. And you can't get any more people on the TriMet system. Say, uh, frankly, on the bus system right now, uh, generally good on-time performance has actually been improving, um, but one of the things I would just note, and I'm sure Doug will can answer more detailed questions about this for you, but is that when we see 
uh, we see uh, on performance <coughs> dramatically reduced during peak hours simply because of the great levels of congestion we're beginning to see around the system and that affects uh, us as well as everyone else. So there are a lot of, a lot of challenges associated with um, responding to that uh, which we are taking on as a task is, um, to really make our service as good as it could be. It, it's true. It's, there's unprecedented levels of congestion in Portland, and and that's a, as a result of Metro and TriMet, and they've and they've done a poor job in planning. And and Neil's going to be coming in with another, you know, we're going to fix it next time with 2.4 billion. I made a tape of Neil's uh, speech, if you want to call it that, to whoever that was out in West County, where where the, the Tribune wrote that article about. Neil needing this money and blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm going to do that at a later date. But why would you trust? These are the same people that created the problem. You don't hire the people who created the mess to fix the mess. That's what they've done in Los Angeles. That's what they've done in Seattle. They hired, they hired the same people that created the mess to fix the mess. And obviously, they got conned. And... You, you know, it's hard to vote no on a light rail. It, it, I can, if, you're, if you're a layman and you don't know any of this, and most people don't have the slightest idea about any of this, somebody says, hey, I'll put a light rail from Tigard, and you can get on instead of driving, and they, a layman would say, why not? Why not? Why not do that? Of course. So it's easy, it's easy, fairly easy to get this kind of stuff passed because people don't understand what they're actually getting into. And they certainly don't understand that they're giving them their own personal money to the same people that created the problem. So with that, I, uh, if that, unless there are particular questions about those responses, I'll continue with my report, Mr. President. Please proceed. Okay, very good. Um, the first thing I wanted to bring up is uh, some very troubling rumors that have been out there. And since we're out in uh, particularly East County, I wanted to really make the point very firmly. The rumors are that there have been a TriMet collaboration with ICE in doing um, uh, raids on uh, to, to enforce federal immigration rules. buses, there were this collaboration and that people of color in particular were kicked off the bus associated with this. And I just want to reiterate, those rumors are absolutely false. Um, we have not ever and we do not work with ICE. Um, indeed, there's a fed, uh, uh, Oregon revised statute where our transit police are strictly prohibited from enforcing immigration laws. And why this is, um, I, I would also note that we've heard some rumors that there are other people who are, uh, um, if you will, impersonating ICE agents on the bus. And uh, we don't believe those rumors are true either, although we have not, uh, our, our staff have not reported any in instance of that uh, as uh, our police or our hired security. Um, and we've not received direct reports from customers ourselves. So we believe those are rumors as well. But this is so concerning to me because we really want TriMet to be this port in the storm where people feel safe, where everybody in our community feels safe and knows they can go there to be safe and to meet their, their daily needs. I sure hope he's not lying about that. I, you know, I definitely doubt that TriMet would ever do anything like that. But uh, you got to remember these are the police, okay? And the police all talk to each other. And they do what they want. We know this, right? The police do what they want. They don't answer to anybody. And so if some transit cop has a buddy in immigration and the immigration says, hey, tip me off when you get somebody who's illegal, who's to say they're not going to do it? Um, so we've worked really hard with the media, with lawmakers, community partners, friends in social media uh, to try to counter these rumors, to put a stop to them. Um, if we, if there are details about impersonation, that sort of thing, we we will investigate and we will follow up. 
but my message right here and right now is that we want TriMet to be a safe place for everybody. Um, I think it's that trust between our community and our staff and our particular security forces is really, really key and uh, we won't violate that trust, uh, period. So I just wanted to make that point particularly while we're here in this um, community. Um, related to ridership, I think it's very clear that January was kind of an odd month uh, with a great deal of uh, snow and ice uh, uh, interfering with people's travel. Um, the, the numbers, I think, are really interesting, though. Overall, our weekly ridership was impacted, but down only about 1.4 percent. And when you think about the number of days that we were affected by ice and snow events, um, that was really interesting. The, there are other two other factors associated with that. One is that during peak hours, we were essentially flat. Uh, it was down one-tenth of a percent. There's obviously a very simple answer to that. People weren't couldn't drive. They tried to take TriMet, <laughs> and they tried. <laughs> they got stuck. You know, you will get home eventually on TriMet. You know, let's you know if you're doing commute hours, and they did a good. They tried the best they can. I mean, with the limited resources, but obviously the the ridership didn't go down because they probably gained a whole bunch of new riders and people in cars who tried not to drive. They knew they knew better than getting their car. So, I mean, that's a logical explanation that people had no choice. So that's why your, your ridership should have gone up 50%, but it couldn't do that. So, yeah. So during the peak hour, we continued to serve the commute, and the number of people uh, commuting was about the same as normal on, on TriMet. I do suspect we had some people not just choosing not to travel during the peak hours, but other people chose to travel via TriMet. Uh, so overall flat on the peak hour. Uh, the rider ship loss was really from weekday off peak, uh, and that was down about 6.8% system wide. And I think it, it just simply follows that people were not taking discretionary trips during those weather conditions so that uh, the off peak trip travel was down. The other interesting thing, and I know a number of the board members participated in this and were uh, part of crowded buses and trains, uh, but we had a 14% weekend increase uh, due primarily to the uh, Women's March that was held and in downtown <coughs> Portland. Um, the, the, the interesting number for the Orange Line, by the way, is that was actually up 26% over normal weekend service. So. Um, I, again, a very interesting month with some interesting traits, but overall, uh, I think we performed well, uh, just given the challenges of the weather during that month. 